So is my screen visible with the presentation? Yeah. Yes. yes, you are. Okay. Yes. Fantastic. So what we're going to do is we're just going to have a little bit of a recap uh, of yesterday. Uh, and then what I am going to do is basically talk a little bit about mentorship. Uh, from my perspective, I think what is very important is that, uh, you know, we support you as best as possible for the course. And clearly what's been articulated by a few of the participants is that you will not have local mentors. So the way around that is I've sent you all a logbook today. Now, as part of that logbook, there is clearly uh, a competency uh, checklist of, I would say, what is the bare minimum of what you, we expect you to achieve? And by no means do we expect you to achieve all these things within you know, a three-month period. As I said, we're assuming that all of you are kind of entering at L1, L2 learner profiles, and we'll gradually make a process uh, kind of progressed move towards L3, L4 over the next 12 months. Now, I would say that the best way to kind of be able to verify the competencies is when you peer review your images, when we peer review your images, uh, I would like you to keep a record of the date and time that we peer reviewed those particular competencies for you to fill in your logbook. Now, the logbook can be maintained and kept online in a Dropbox account. So for those of you who need mentorship, uh, I will create a Dropbox uh, account for you with your logbook stored in that. I would request that you download, fill that in and upload to that particular Dropbox account. And what we do is that every four weeks we'll go into that account and we will attest those competencies. So that is what we can do. I would also request very humbly that if you have got colleagues in your department who are able to mentor you and are able to kind of sign off competencies, that would be fantastic because we do have about 35 people on the course. Uh, it's going to be a real challenge doing this for everybody. So uh, I think your help would be uh, very, very, uh, I would say, uh, important for me. Now, just a recap of yesterday. So yesterday, what we did was we went through uh, three aspects of our module. So the first aspect was nuts and bolts. So just to kind of uh, give you a feel, you should now all have access to the online portal. So I've added the online portal to your accounts today. You will have all the chapters up to RDS on it, uh, which are complete referenced. Uh, and then after that, there are chapters which will be added uh, as the portal gets updated on a weekly basis. The rough dates of when they're added uh, are actually in those sections. As a as a start, I think what is very important is that you, you familiarize yourselves very well, I would say, with the first five modules. Uh, I think the most important aspect of learning lung ultrasound is knowing uh, ultrasound physiology, physics. And then after that, really what I'd say is what is very important is your ability to be able to recognize the nomenclature that we will talk about. Uh, to be able to standardize what you're being able to recognize and report. And today's talk will basically cover how we standardize that. So there are two standard protocols described in the literature, both of which I've forwarded to you. The first one is by Jing Lu. Uh, he is probably the father of uh, neonatal ultrasound uh, medicine uh, and has produced probably the largest number of publications that you find in the literature on the subject. Uh, but there's also an endorsement by Curipa, and I would, I would really strongly recommend that you read those articles. But what they do is they give us a standardized approach to how we scan. More importantly, also gives us uh, tips on how we prepare the baby, prepare the machine, and importantly, uh, standardizes what, what we describe in nomenclature as standardized terminology. So uh, are there any questions from yesterday about anything that anybody wanted to ask me before we move on. So I usually count to five and then I move on. So I'm assuming there are no questions. Okay. Uh, so what we are going to do today is we're going to talk a little bit about just uh, what pattern recognition really is and what the normal lung looks like. Now, most uh, of uh, ultrasound training uh, relies on the fact that when you when you do ultrasound, uh, some elements of it will be uh, a reflection of what the actual internal organs look like. 
But in lung ultrasound, actually, what we're hugely dependent on is what we call as lung artifacts. So what you're really not looking at is the structure of the lung. What you're looking at is artifacts that are generated, which then generate a certain structure, which from our perspective, we translate into the lung appearance. Uh, now, this is just a normal lung profile. Uh, in a neonate with a pleural line that's clearly visible. And what you can see is this pleural line when ultrasound waves come through produces reverberations as you go deeper into the lung. Now, clearly bone will reflect back and hence what you find is when you have a rib, you actually have a shadow in front, but the reverberations that go further down produce what is called an A-line appearance without any vertical lines, which we call uh, B-lines. Uh, classically, when you look at that uh, on a moving image, what you can see is this appearance there, where you have a shimmering thin pleura, which is about 0.5 of a millimeter, with A-lines, which often go down in their intensity as you go into the lung, because the reflection of uh, sound waves uh, gets attenuated. Now, what you can clearly see is these horizontal lines. You can't see any vertical lines. And for the sharp-eyed amongst you, what you can see is a very slow margin of the pleura moving. So when I look at this lung ultrasound, I'm, I'm looking for things that are normal and really sliding a pleura is one of them, but pleura looks smooth, continuous. Uh, it's not broken. It's not irregular. It looks of a normal thickness uh, with parallel A-lines. And in essence, this is what we would call a normal A profile, which is what you see once a neonate has transitioned. Uh, it's just very important for you to realize this is cross gestation. So actually when you give a preterm baby surfactant, uh, they can transition to an A profile uh, in uh, a particular lung zone, which has received surfactant pretty, pretty much very quickly. So it's not as if this is just found in uh, term babies. It is across the stage. And I'll be showing you images of babies who are 22 weeks. And, uh, you know, it'll be very interesting. You can see similar profiles in those babies. Now, this is normal, but let's look at a case. So this is patient X. Uh, this is a preterm baby who was 23 plus three weeks, who's now two weeks of age. So about 25 plus three weeks corrected age. The baby was uh, delivered by vaginal root as a breach. It was a rough start. The baby was intubated and ventilated at birth. It took a few attempts. The baby had surfactant and delivery suite, but clearly was quite sick in the first few days, ended up having three doses of surfactant, uh, most of which actually, uh, the first dose, in fact, went down the right main bronchus, uh, hence the repeat doses. Uh, the baby has now had quite a, a difficult period. And uh, as of the 10th, this baby has started deteriorating. So from having been on volume guarantee ventilation, uh, this baby has gone on to needing high frequency oscillatory ventilation, a map of 16, and gone into 100% over the last 24 hours. This is an X-ray that was done contemporaneously today. And what you can see clearly from this X-ray is quite a bit of interstitial change on the right side uh, with the left side looking quite solid. The baby was paralyzed and sedated. And uh, I received a telephone call basically saying uh, in the middle of the night that this baby is now desaturating in 100% on this map. So anybody want to comment on the chest X-ray? Just Karan, would you like to comment on the X-ray? Yeah. yeah, the X-ray is showing a lot of haziness on the left side. The whole of the lung is obliterated. On the right side, we can see the changes in the station, as you said, PI-like pictures there. The okay. ET tube is uh, at the right place. You can see a OG tube going down. Okay. And the right lung appears slightly hyperinflated in this section. Okay, excellent. What do we think about the left lung? So I'm just curious. Do you think that's collapse? Do you think that's consolidation? Anybody? Doesn't uh, seem like a collapse because we can see some variation. And there's no much of uh, media channel shift also on the left side. It's 
sorry in some if I... but there could be some areas of collapse also because you can see the bronchograms so more like consolidation but there yep. could be some element of collapse okay so fair point you can see an air bronchogram coming up here but there is rib crowding and uh, you know uh, if you look at the hyperinflation pushing the mediastinum you have quite bad interstitial kind of appearance with cystic change uh, which is quite early at two days now you have a baby who's desaturating at 70 percent. so what are the differentials that come to mind anna anna vaz would you like to have a go at that so what differentials come to mind you've had a baby who's sedated paralyzed on that map and you've just suddenly acutely started desaturating no more thorax okay fantastic anything else the theta is not in the place beautiful so kind of the dope approach but we might have secretions and we might have atelectasis on that side so we've lost lung volume now this is an x-ray that's been done a few hours before so the option is we can get another x-ray for a baby who's desaturating in 70 percent which will kind of be a lot of handling for a baby that's sedated and paralyzed you know some units can put plates in their uh kind of uh uh resustairs or uh, open resustairs, but you'd have to lift the baby. For some units, while we can actually put them in the incubator, you still have to position the baby in a position on the plate to be able to kind of get the baby in right position. Now with the pneumothorax, that's not great. What about translumination? What do we think? So we can transluminate and see if there's a pneumothorax. I'm not uh, doing that, <laughs> I don't know. Sure. No problems. So what I'd say is would that you, yeah, yeah, Kirti's would you coming. also consider pericardial effusion if it's like a sudden thing that has happened and there is a long line going deep into the RA? Uh, yes, that's a fair point. Uh, what I'd say is that common being common, I, I would think of this X-ray and an acute deterioration. In, and I like to use the kind of airway breathing circulation approach. So airway means, is my tube in the right place? Am I, have I got enough wobble? Uh, can I confirm air entry? Uh, you know, I could I could put some entitle on and do that, check with some IPPV. Breathing wise, I mean, I will examine, there may be an asymmetry in air entry. My worry about translumination and we use translumination in this baby is that it did translumate on that right side. Now, I'm kind of stable. My pulses are palpable. Uh, I've got a decent blood pressure, uh, you know. So the question from my perspective is, I, I could stick a needle in that side to treat this baby for the saturations, but this baby does have quite a bit of interstitial change with air in it. And, uh, you know, clearly from my perspective, an extremely preterm baby with quite immature skin can sometimes show mild translumination. What I am going to confess is this baby didn't light up like a bulb that you see with the tension pneumothorax. So again, the options are we can do a chest X-ray or we can do a lung ultrasound. So first of all, just to say, if you look at the right side, a lot of interstitial change, it's really, really worse in the right lower, uh, right middle and uh, lateral zones. And the left side is completely white out. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with the left side. Uh, so this is the left anterior side. And if you look at the initial appearance of normal lung, you have pleura, that's nice and linear, normal, uh, not broken, not uh, irregular, uh, kind of thin, about half a centimeter, some A-lines. But when you come to this particular appearance here on L1, which is the left side of the lung, which is kind of this part anteriorly, what you find is that there is, you know, there's there are no A-lines at all. There's just a, what we would call a completely uh, white lung, uh, You've got a pleura that's very irregular. You've also got these subpleural consolidations that you can see over there. Uh, this is a static bronchogram. What does that look like when you actually... You can see the pleura there. So you have sliding. Now that's a very important sign because if you have sliding, that excludes the pneumothorax. But what you can see is virtually, there are no A-lines. This is kind of a white lung appearance, a, a, a very dominant B profile. And you can see these small static air bronchograms coming through here, which would kind of give you uh, the impression that there is some air coming into this lung, very uniform kind of an appearance. So in my kind of this particular, this is a consolidated uh, area of lung. Uh, so clearly no, no 
from the left anterior. When I look at L2, so again, very irregular pleura, very regular pleura, but there are some A-lines there. Again, a very dominant B profile because you've got these vertical areas of consolidated kind of coalesced B lines. Uh, we call them compact B lines. And then you've got the small area here, which is white with some air bronchogram. And you can see the air bronchogram moving. So there's air coming into this lung. But this is, again, this is an area of what we would call as focal consolidation. The pleura is just about moving. You know, it's very slow. But again, the left side is pretty much consolidated. When I go to the left lateral zone, What you can see is a little bit more aeration in that left kind of upper zone. You can see some A-lines there, but again, a very dominant B profile, coalesced B-lines, pleura that's broken. And then you can see the small area, what we call as shredded pleura. So this is what is called a positive shred sign. Now that's kind of the left lung. And this is the left lateral lower part of the lung. And what we're really looking for is I want to exclude an omothorax, but what I can see is the pleura has been sliding in all those regions. This is a dominant B profile, coalesced uh, compact B lines, uh, pleura that's quite irregular, thickened, broken. Uh, again, some subpleural consolidations there, but really what would a pneumothorax look like on a lung ultrasound? So if you look at this, what you can see is that you have on the left-hand side, an area where you can see pleural sliding. Whereas on the right side, you can't see any pleural sliding. You can see A-line profile. Now this is an area where you have a small pneumothorax and basically a small anterior pneumothorax where you've got pleura that doesn't slide with a dominant A-line profile below it. Uh, if you put, uh, M mode on this, you'll see what is called a barcode sign. And at least on the left side, I can't see that. Let's the right side. So we're going to go R1, R2, R3. And if you remember, I told you that the anterior inferior and the anterior lateral kind of parts of the lung, sorry, the lateral part of the lung is, is heavily damaged. So when you look at uh, the R1 appearance, so you can see what I would say is very little pleural sliding. Uh, this is a completely white out lung, but the pleura is completely damaged. And what you've classically got here is an area of shred. So the pleura is shredded with what is uh, subpleural consolidation. So, I mean, that's lung that's been completely destroyed. And for me, that would indicate an infective process. Now, while the pleura is not sliding as well, there is some sliding there, also a lung pulse. So you can see the lower part of the lung moving with the heart. Now, Again, this would be a feature of consolidation because if you remember, for a pneumat, you need to have A-lines. Uh, you, you have no pleural sliding with A-lines. There, what you can clearly see is you can't see any A-lines at all. So you have what is a, a completely white out lung with lung consolidation and shred sign and a lung pulse, which again would give me the impression that this lung is uh, consolidated possibly mnemonic, and the pneumonia could be infective. You've got shred sign there. As you move down to the lower part of the lung, so R2, which is right anterior inferior, this is the liver shadow, the diaphragm coming into view. And what you see from your perspective is lung... Excuse, excuse yeah. me, Alok. Uh, can yeah. you use the cursor as a pointer just to yeah. uh, get the maximum benefit? Thank you. Uh, maybe not today, uh, but maybe next time. I apologize just because I'll have to find it. Uh, sorry about that, but hopefully next time I'll have the cursor. Can you see the mouse? No. Okay. So in this still video, there is a plural margin over here. Can you see my pointer at the top or you can't? No, Alok, we can't. No, okay. we can't. Okay, let's try and see if we can sort this out. Okay, now can you see it? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank yes. you. That's really kind. So again, just going back to R1, so 
if I just take you back very quickly through the previous slides, just so that you can get a good idea of things. So this is the plural line that you see over here. And the plural line basically is showing sliding. It's, it's, it, it's very, very slow. But what you've got is a classical A line profile. There are no B lines. Some people may think that's a vertical B line. Actually, that's probably a comet tail. It doesn't go all the way to the bottom. I'll explain all of these terminologies, but this is what you call a normal lung profile in an EN8. Now, if I look at the X-ray, as I've described, the right side of the lung is what is really damaged. But really the question from my perspective is, did you have consolidation with a collapse on the left side? And really what I'd say is that for me, you've got an air bronchogram, which is clearly demonstrated in this kind of video. And these are static air bronchograms that you can see over here. So what you can see is these static air bronchograms over here, which again would give us a feel that this is more consolidation than atelectasis. If it was complete atelectasis, you'd have no air coming into this lung. The fact that you've got static air bronchograms, which look bright, would suggest there's air coming into this lung. So this would go more in favor of a condition. Uh, there are obviously L2 and L3. So you've got some A lines. So there is lung aeration in both these images. So, you know, from my perspective, you have a small area of atelectasis that you can see over there, but I would say the left side of the lung is predominantly consolidated. But really what I'm trying to get from is a pneumothorax. And if you look at a pneumothorax, pneumothorax is classically defined by uh, a line that does not slide. And you can see that on the right side, there's absent sliding and dominant A lines completely. You'll never have B lines. Now, pneumothorax for me is, I'm more worried it might be on the right side. And when the x-ray on the right, sorry, the lung ultrasound on the right side, what I can clearly see is this really irregular damaged pleura. And below this irregular damaged pleura, there is what we call an area of complete shredding of the pleura with a subpleural area that looks hypoechoic. This is what we call as classical shred sign. And it's a sign seen in infective pneumonia. So again, as we, as I said, when you look at the right uh, anterior inferior part, it gets worse. And clearly here you can see it's really bad. And when you come to the lateral part, which is R3, uh, I mean, the lung, the pleura is completely destroyed. There's no pleural sliding, but there is a massive area of cavitation here, which basically reflects what is a big shred sign. There are also these subpleural, uh, I would say, air bronchograms that you can see over here, which is static. These are all signs again. So we would define this as a consolidation at this particular point, but with significant areas of uh, breakdown and kind of infective pneumonia. Now, uh, what is important is the difference between static and dynamic air bronchograms. So actually static air bronchograms don't move at all and dynamic air bronchograms move. So when air goes in and out, or fluid for that matter, air looks bright, but you can clearly see what dynamic uh, air bronchograms look like. And in this particular kind of field, I can't see any dynamic air bronchograms uh, clearly. But if you go back to the x-ray, my, my clinical conclusion at this particular point is I can't see a pneumothorax anywhere. What I can see is lung that's quite heavily destroyed with an infective kind of a pathology. Now, for me, the key question is, is this baby on antibiotics? So cultured started on antibiotics at this point of time, pneumothorax. And really the changes that we made on ventilation were uh, actually going up on the map to recruit lung because of the left lung being quite uh, consolidated. Uh, but more importantly, nursing the baby right side down so that we could actually keep the baby from getting further lung damage uh, and interstitial air into that right side, very similar to how we would manage PIE. And within a period of about 60 minutes, we had the baby with saturations of 90%. I did not do a chest X-ray. And I think what I would try to emphasize through this presentation is how useful a tool lung ultrasound can be in excluding certain clinical diagnosis that need acute treatment like a pneumothorax, but more important, it can also give you an idea about lung condition, alter how you treat a particular condition. So this baby, a ha baby had Klebsiella on its uh, ET secretions and a CRP that has risen. 
And clearly from our perspective, uh, we've been able to make that diagnosis without a lot of handling. Now, just to give you an idea, I finished that lung ultrasound in, in under two minutes. So really what I'm doing is capturing the areas and reviewing those images on my screen. So a very short period of handling for the baby. So what I am now going to do is take you through the chapter on standardized protocols in uh, lung ultrasound. And uh, what I would say is that if you take any diagnosis, and I'm just taking neonatal RDS as a, as a kind of uh, diagnostic uh, kind of uh, condition, you need to standardize how you're going to do the scan. And the reason for that is every aspect of it uh, means that uh, standardizing it helps you deliver uh, what I would say is accurate clinical details, an accurate clinical report, optimized good high quality images with a view to minimally destabilizing a baby, uh, making sure the baby doesn't become hypothermic or develop hypoxemia. And that means that you need to use your machine uh, well with the most appropriate probes, uh, scanning the right regions, uh, and preferably I would say at your learning stage, focusing on anterior and lateral regions. But I would say by the time you've kind of gained the skills uh, to do proper lung scanning. There's a standard protocol about how and what regions to do. And importantly, uh, if you don't want to miss lung consolidation uh, in every region, then you have to do transfer scanning of each intercostal space, which can be quite a lot of handling. You also need to know what a limited scan is. And uh, I'll give you an example. I've only done the anterior and lateral regions in the baby that we've just talked about because I don't want to destabilize the baby. Importantly, air will rise up in a baby that's supine. So if I'm looking for a pneumothorax, I should be able to pick that up in the anterior and lateral zones, and I should be able to pick up the lung point in the lateral zone. I think a tension pneumothorax would basically present in the anterior and lateral zones. So I don't necessarily need to do the posterior zone. So what about uh, and how do we prepare an infant when, when we want to do a lung ultrasound? So very importantly, big term babies, I would say are much more challenging than the small preterm babies that don't move around. Uh, for those of them who are infants uh, who can get the hands into the midline, they love playing with your probe and it can be quite a challenge. So what is very important is that you have, uh, what I kind of talk about is the concept of infant containment. And infant containment basically says that uh, what we should be doing is having this scan done by two people. I think if you want to do a lung ultrasound or an echocardiograph, uh, alone uh, with a very uh, awake, vigorous baby, it might be challenging to get good views. Uh, sucrose and a pacifier greatly help, but containment maneuvers basically means how you would hold the baby. Now, there's a big problem in this picture. And I would say that my ideal view uh, would be that you should swaddle babies like this. And swaddling keeps them nice and warm. But uh, what I like to do is use a very cozy kind of a towel or a, a soft blanket or anything that the mother might have brought to kind of get the nurses to do what we call is a nursing swaddle. Uh, get the baby some sucrose, have a pacifier if possible. And if it's good, uh, have the baby fed before you actually do the scan. And really what you'd really like to do is start with the anterior regions, move laterally and then move posteriorly to place the baby. But containment is very important. What is also very important is when you use the probe, the more pressure you apply, it's painful. So what is important is that holding the probe, you want to maintain contact, but you don't want to apply too much pressure. Now, for infant positioning, I would say that if you have very sick babies, really what you want to do is scan the baby in the position it is. Now, if you have a baby who, say, for example, is prone ventilated, uh, and is unstable, uh, sedated, paralyzed, you don't want to disturb the baby. I would be doing the prone and lateral areas. And I'd really be asking myself uh, how much I need to move to be able to get the anterior areas. So you might want to actually start scanning for babies in the position they are in, and then getting your helper to try and move them as best as they can to get uh, all areas. More importantly, what is very important is gravity has a significant effect on lung ultrasound images. And if you're in the supine and prone areas, fluid in the lung tends to settle with gravity into the uh, more uh, regional basal areas. Now, one of the problems with that is that can actually uh, impact your assessment on the lung ultrasound. So a lot of authors, especially if you're examining a baby for respiratory distress syndrome, uh, just scan the anterior and lateral areas for a baby that's uh, supine 
or the posterior lateral areas for a baby that's prone. But for the extended lung scoring kind of uh, strategies, which you have uh, a lot of literature on, but which I don't personally use, uh, what you would have to do is move the baby from supine to left lateral to prone. And if you do that, the, 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 the recommendation from Nadia and Almedina is to actually give the baby about 60 minutes and then do your scan. Now, again, that's two kinds of episodes of handling. Uh, it means you have to leave the scanner there. So it, it can take a long time. Now, sedatives. So just again, what you really want when you're doing your lung ultrasound is a breathing baby where possible. Breathing really helps. Uh, it helps optimize the position of uh, the baby's crudal sliding and that you can see it much better. So I rarely use sedatives, uh, very, very rarely, not even in the sickest of babies. I don't think preterm babies, really, even when they're very sick, uh, move around a lot to kind of interfere with what is uh, what can be very rapid scanning. I think for me, what's more important is that you can make these babies very unstable by actually pressing too hard and actually preventing ventilation in an intubated ventilated baby. So you must be very careful. Personally, sedatives have side effects, so use them. I think if you're worried that a baby is very unstable, I, I'm not saying you shouldn't use them, but just in my practice, I've never needed to. Uh, Pre-oxygenation. Now, just a few things. Uh, sometimes you will be examining the sickest babies. Those babies might be desaturating. Lung ultrasound can cause problems with day recruitment. Even with the lightest touch, some babies can be very sensitive. And I would say that sometimes a little bit of pre-oxygenation and I think if you're worried, sometimes a little bit of lung recruitment uh, might be needed prior to you starting your lung ultrasound. For those of you who know me, uh, you probably know I've done a huge amount of work with hypothermia. And uh, I can't emphasize enough that for extremely preterm babies, when you're doing their golden hour scan, which includes the head, the lungs, and vascular access, what really you want to do is what we call is a sweep the total duration for the scan should be minutes. So really what we're doing is a screening ultrasound to screen to make sure there's no large IVH, uh, a screening ultrasound to basically look at umbilical lines and their positions, and then basically making an assessment for lung. Now, if they're non-invasively ventilated, that's even more important because if you handle a baby for a very long time, these babies will obviously de-recruit and then you're more likely to then need rescue surfactant with LISA or with insure, depending on what your departmental policy is. Uh, more importantly, these babies, if you have and do long scans, can become hypothermic. And if that is the case, then you're going to have surfactant inactivation, especially in the first hour of life. I mean, for a 22, 23 weeker, humidity, closing the doors, and minimizing handling is absolutely crucial. So your golden hour is stabilizing these babies based on your kind of departmental protocol and provided the baby's airway breathing circulation are stable and you don't have to intervene clinically, you really want to complete your golden hour sweep in as short a time as possible to minimize insensible loss in the baby becoming hypothermic. So I think the reason why I've started with this is it's really important that you think of your baby, not just for getting good scans, but actually because of the impact that lung ultrasound can actually have when you're performing it in a sick baby. Uh, just a few things for baby's comfort. So distraction works really nicely. Uh, so, you know, uh, keeping something for the bigger babies, you know, if, you, if you're using lung ultrasound in an outpatient setting, uh, sucrose in a pacifier sometimes might not work, but if you think the baby's too active, well, can he have a feed? But the other thing is a little bit of distraction with a bright object. Uh, be very cautious when you start doing, uh, I would say, the transdiaphragmatic approach. It's painful. Uh, it makes babies uh, very uncomfortable. And that's why I would say stick to scanning your anterior lateral lesions based on the position of the baby. But make sure your baby is completely comfortable and make sure you're comfortable. If you start scanning uh, you, in a position that where the bed is too low, you will break your back. And trust me, your images won't be great. Exposure to prevent hypothermia. So has balances and risks. Now, I'm just curious. Uh, let's throw it out there, guys. What do we think about this photograph and doing a lung ultrasound? Anybody? 
Dr. Dabur, Dr. Sharif Dabur, I just wonder, what do you think about this photograph when I'm showing you the cursor and doing a lung ultrasound? Um, I think uh, keeping the cold gel just underneath uh, close might not be very good for the babies. Like in the, in the bottom uh, image on the left side, uh, I think that's the ideal thing, just to have uh, um, the chest uncovered rather Beautiful. than to leave the gel uh, underneath the baby's clothes. Uh, fantastic. I think the other aspect to it is how well are you going to be able to scan the anterior and lateral regions? You'll have to push these clothes up. You won't be able to get your probe. Certainly your transverse imaging for each intercostal space is going to be very difficult. The more you try to pull the clothes up, the more you'll upset the baby. It's a recipe for disaster. Really, what I'd say is try to expose your baby as feasible. And a good example in this situation is I will use pre-warm gel, but the other aspect to it is we have, uh, at least in the hospital where I work currently, overhead warmers. So actually get this baby under an overhead warmer to keep him warm. It's beautiful. These babies actually love it. And more importantly, it keeps them comfortable. But really what you want to do is have good exposure. I'd say exposure is good over here, but just think about your lateral and posterior regions. And when you have to pull this up and the baby cries and gets upset and you put the baby in a prone position where he's trying to lift his head, uh, it's not ideal. So exposure is important, but think about keeping your baby warm. Uh, in particular, having an overhead, maybe using a resustere if you feel that's the case. And these kind of babies really, really helps. We've talked about containment, so I'm not going to repeat that, but this is just containment within an incubator and an example of how you can keep the babies comfortable. Now, when you're doing your scans, babies will move the hands. The hands will come in the way. The babies will breathe. They'll get upset. So getting kind of image stillness can be a challenge. Don't hesitate to ask your assistant maybe to hold the hand outside of your anatomical kind of field to be able to optimize your lung images, or maybe just if you're doing the lateral side, as is being done over here, to turn the baby to that side to ensure you get better lateral images, hold the hand so that it doesn't actually come into your field and knock your probe about. Uh, you can see how difficult it can be when a baby's moving its hands and you want to keep still images uh, and get loops. You know, it, it's quite challenging. So this baby is obviously, we need to restrain that hand. Uh, Again, just think about the level of the incubator. Now, you might think I'm feeding you eggs and I'm taking you through these things. I cannot emphasize how important this is. Your comfort and how you scan produces the best quality images when you're comfortable and the baby's comfortable. So it's a small thing, but you can see how restraining the arm in this particular position basically helps to optimize your ability to actually get scans and images. So I strongly recommend from my perspective that you have a second helper who's able to restrain, contain. I don't like using the word restrain. I like using the word contain. Uh, again, subdiaphragmatic images can be painful. I usually do them at the end if I have to do them when I'm looking for a pleural effusion in particular, just because uh, they're not really nice and comfortable for the baby. And you can see how when you press hard, the baby becomes uncomfortable. You can see the breathing, what happens in this particular situation. It's, it's something that the baby really doesn't like. So if you want to do what we call is eventually uh, your R7 uh, and R8 images, uh, then I would say leave them to the end unless uh, you think that that is going to be the area of interest. So as emphasized, sedatives usually not needed, pacifiers, sucrose, keeping the baby warm, containment, distraction, you know, a common sense approach to really how you want to optimize things. But if you have a baby moving like this, uh, ooh, it's not going to be the easiest way to do scans. Infection control. Now, this is heavily emphasized. And I would say that if you work in a unit where there is a high incidence of gram-negative sepsis, transmitting Klebsiella happens through the ultrasound machine. But not only that, there are also risks to the baby. If you look at this baby, there are lines, uh, there are potentially a lot of different kind of monitoring devices. Uh, there is a nasogastric tube, there is a line, a scalp long line. And clearly when you go to that chest and you move your hand about it, there is a, a real potential that if you're not doing that in a sterile uh, aseptic approach, uh, not washing your hands, but more importantly, not disinfecting your probe there is a risk that you can give this baby infection from another baby. But more importantly, if you're between babies, you can pick up 
an infection from this baby and transmit it to the other baby. Please follow your local protocols. Okay, now what probes do we select and how do we go about doing that? So the traditional probes that are used for neonatal lung ultrasound are standard linear probes, the hockey stick, and uh, I would say the linear probe. These are high frequency probes with a frequency which is greater than or equal to nine. I would say a minimum of 10, but you need to play with the frequencies uh, in order to optimize your image quality. And I would say that in the smaller babies, you need uh, to view the pleura and in particular, the superficial parts of the lung with a good deal of accuracy, especially if you want to look at the pleural margin, you want to look for sliding. And for that, you might have to use higher frequencies in the range of 12 to 14. Most new machines allow you to start with the probe in a particular frequency and then to change the frequency of the probe in order for you to get adequate penetration. Obviously in bigger babies, you will need to have uh, the ability to be able to see deeper structures, deeper parts of the lung. And we recommend that a depth of about four centimeters as a bare minimum is used. Uh, obviously uh, to optimize the images in the deeper parts of the lung, you have to use a lower frequency. Now, I was asked in the last class, can we use a curvilinear probe? Uh, can we use the head ultrasound probe? Can we use the abdominal ultrasound probe? Yes, you can. And what is important again is that you're adjusting your frequency. The usually most, uh, I would say, curvilinear head ultrasound probes are between five and eight. So you might actually want to use eight at the highest. But more importantly, what I would say to you is that the structure of doing the scan remains exactly the same. And you then have to interpret those images, keeping in mind that you're using a convex probe. So these are the difference in images of the same I'm baby. I'm so sorry, Alok, yeah, to interrupt. Yeah. There are lots of, uh, I think, candidates are waiting to be logged in. I think they are keeping sending WhatsApp. So maybe if they can come, if you allow them to. Okay, I have admitted them. So if you could just mute yourself, uh, just a humble request, guys. For me, punctuality is very crucial and going in and out of the meeting kind of drops the flow for the participants, but also because we're going to share these videos with everybody, I'd really humbly request that you stay within the meeting because it becomes really difficult for me to go back and admit everybody if you leave meetings in between. I think if you're busy and you can't attend, please don't worry because Again, I will be having another session on this for the people who kind of miss out, but more importantly, you can catch up with these sessions online. So just coming back to uh, the impact of the probe. So this is basically the same image in a neonate using the convex probe and the linear probe. And what you can classically see with the convex probe is you can see a plural line that looks very thick, but a dominant A profile, there are no B lines, but actually when you use the linear probe, what you can see is there is clearly a B profile in the upper lung field with an A profile in the lower lung fields. And this is actually what we call as the double lung point. And this is a baby with respiratory distress. So probes can impact your, your ability to be able to interpret scans. What is important is that you clinically correlate with your probe. And I think if you were using a convex probe and you wanted to see this image, really you want to use the highest frequency because the superficial parts of the lung and their visualization is quite crucial. The other thing that is really important is your focus. Now, focus in every machine is slightly different and I will be sending you a video on normology for the GE, uh, but really the best place to keep your focus is at the plural line, if you can see my marker over there. And the reason you want to keep the focus on the plural line is because you want to see the plural line with the superficial structures. But if you want to take and see deeper structures with a little bit more accuracy, what you can see in this image is the resolution basically goes down as you go to the deeper structures. So what you can do is you can change the, the focus point to a slightly deeper region to be able to see things better. So, you know, playing with your machine to optimize images is quite crucial. I will show you on a video how we actually do that. Again, just impact of the probe. So if you use a kind of a low end equipment and these are kind of identical high frequency transducers, but clearly what you're looking at is two different probes that are being used. And this is uh, the, the, the hockey stick, as you can see in this particular point, it's actually a linear probe. You can see multiple rib spaces. 
But clearly, the interpretation in this is a very irregular kind of dented plural line with subplural consolidation and compact B lines. I mean, this is a very classical feature of respiratory distress syndrome. But actually, when you look at the other probe, you can't see any of the subplural consolidations. You see a very clear, thick plural line. And uh, this is uh, what you call white lung with no compact B lines. Now, this is more in favor of transient tachypnea of newborn. Now, if I told you that this is actually uh, a baby who's 25 weeks, who's not had surfactant, who's working hard on the ventilator, then you know, actually clinically correlating, this is the more accurate image that you're really looking at. So there can be an impact of the probe. I think the reason I'm highlighting this is if you're doing serial scans, you want to do a pre-post surfactant scan, and you you've done a scan and your colleague does a scan and you use different probes, you might actually get different interpretations based on the scans, uh, which then kind of create confusion. So where possible, if somebody's used the hockey stick or the linear probe, stick with it. If you're kind of using uh, and you don't have either of those available, go with the convex probe with the highest frequency, the abdominal probe uh, or the head ultrasound probe. Again, uh, just another image which basically shows how frequency can uh, alter things. So we just, you know, when you look at image A, uh, using a linear transducer, you're kind of using a frequency of eight at this particular point. And the focus, you know, from your perspective is predominantly at the level of the pleura. Increasing your frequency actually starts revealing elements of subpleural consolidation that you can't see over here. So this is an extremely preterm baby. This is a baby who's about 20 four weeks. So these are babies where you will need higher, higher frequencies. So don't hesitate to increase your frequency to try and achieve, and then clinically correlate. I mean, if this baby is in 50% oxygen after surfactant, clearly there's a worry the surfactant hasn't created much change. So if that's the image you're getting with your probe, it doesn't add up. So I cannot emphasize enough how important clinical correlation is at this particular point of time. Okay. Now, Probe plane positioning. So when you do scanning, scanning is done in two different ways. So the first way to do scanning is what we call is perpendicular scanning, where you hold the probe uh, perpendicular to the thorax and pretty much in contact with the thorax. And you'd be scanning the anterior, lateral, uh, and posterior regions. But then if you wanted to scan each individual space, intercostal space, and a good example is like posterior consolidations or a posterior pneumonia, if you look at the blue protocol and the PLAPS protocol, which I'll talk about later, can be easily missed if you just do the anterior and lateral regions. But again, clinical correlation will tell you when you need to do that. But scanning each uh, horizontal intercostal space needs parallel scanning, and they will give you different appearances. So this is perpendicular scanning for you, multiple ribs seen in this particular space. In an ideal world, what you really want to have is at least rib space, three rib spaces visible in your transverse field when you're using the hockey stick. If you're using a linear probe as they've used over here, that's a long probe. I mean, in an extremely preterm baby, it'll cover your entire lung field. More importantly, what I would say is that uh, really, once you've scanned the regions, you need to label them. But when you look at parallel scanning, really what you're going to have to scan is virtually uh, 12 regions anteriorly and posteriorly, which is quite a bit of handling for the baby. So not everybody recommends that you do parallel scanning unless clinically indicated. But in that, what you see is a normal rib, one space with a plural line. And again, you'll see A lines or B lines depending on what the appearance is. But just remember, you're looking at one cut section of a very small part of the lung, as opposed to perpendicular scanning or longitudinal scanning as it's called, which looks at significant portions of the lung in different areas. So we'll give you a lot more information. Uh, a standard protocol in this situation uh, is to start with uh, perpendicular scanning first. And what I'd normally recommend is that you, you start and you scan the position in which the baby is lying. So say for example, if a baby is prone and you were to start your scanning, uh, what I'd say is, why move the baby uh, supine? You'll have to wait for a little bit of time for gravity to take its effect for you to get real images. So actually, you might want to start your scanning, uh, which is perpendicular scanning, by actually doing the posterior and lateral regions first, then turn your baby, if clinically feasible, 
to uh, a supine position, wait for a bit. Recommendation is usually 30 to 60 minutes and then actually complete your anterior regions. But what you're looking to do is basically do those three regions in an upper and a lower half so that you've got the upper posterior, lower posterior, upper lateral, lower lateral, and then the upper anterior, lower anterior. And you're going to do right and left sides. So that is called a standardized 12 region scan. These are the appearances as you will get on perpendicular scanning. So as I've described to you, the regions to scan in perpendicular scanning are the 12 regions, which basically you should be scanning as a matter of routine, provided it is clinically feasible for you to do that and the baby is stable. Now, the six region scanning, which I will subsequently talk to you about, is done in babies who are extremely small. And that's because if you're using, say for example, a linear probe, you'll pretty much get the right upper and the lower regions by using a linear probe similarly the lateral region and the posterior regions. So that basically means you're just doing right anterior, you're doing right lateral, right posterior, and similarly on the left side, and you scan six regions. A rough cutoff, and I'm not saying there's any evidence for this, is actually using uh, a weight cutoff of about 1500 grams. Now, probe orientation is also very important. So as you can see uh, in this particular image, the hockey stick, this is the marker, it's always oriented towards the baby's head, cranially. So it's really important when you're doing these regions that you don't have this upside down. So probe orientation will always be towards the baby's head, whichever region you're actually scanning. When you're scanning and you're doing what we call as parallel or transfer scanning for each individual intercostal space, the probe position and marker is always towards the right shoulder. So really important that you keep to those probe markers. Uh, markers usually displayed on that corner up there. Uh, a good rule of thumb is you can actually just press lightly on that and that'll tell you whether your probe marker is oriented appropriately or not. Uh, just when you look at parallel longitudinal scanning, you're going to scan each individual uh, intercostal space moving from superior to inferior. And in total, you'll be scanning both anteriorly and posteriorly. Uh, you'll also be scanning laterally. So, you know, that's, that's quite a large area to cover. The last area that you scan, and as I've talked about previously, is actually scanning your subdiaphragmatic area. And your subdiaphragmatic area, uh, is, it, is, it makes babies uh, and produces discomfort. But the way you scan is I start with what is, what I call the vertical situs kind of position that I learned in echocardiography. I position my probe there and then turn it at right angles. And really what you want is the horizontal situs kind of uh, uh, movement where you've got the probe parallel in to the Ziffy sternum. And then what you're going to do is angulate it to the right and angulate it to the left, uh, positioning it upwards towards the shoulders uh, so that you're giving a little bit of tilt and you're using basically what are the liver and the lung uh, sorry, my apologies, the liver and the lung uh, interface to kind of look for what we call as pleural effusions. That would be on the right side. On the left side, you'd be using the spleen. But a good example for you is that when you're in the position of being in the ziphoid process, so if I go back to this image, really you're holding it horizontal, marker towards, again, what I would say is very important from my perspective, that you, you angulate the probes inferiorly, and you use the liver and the margin of the diaphragm to try and get your interface. So when you look at the liver in the situs view, you see what is the IVC, you see the aorta, and you see the, this is the diaphragmatic margin that you see over here. And then what you see over here is the diaphragm. Uh, so you're just angulating the probe, if I describe, towards the right and the left, pointing towards the shoulders, I will demonstrate it to you on video, but what you really pick up in situations like this is lung consolidation and pleural effusions. And uh, often uh, I would say to you, even normal lung sometimes gives you the liver-like tissue-like appearance. And that is basically called mirror artifact. It doesn't always mean you have a consolidation. Lung partitioning, again, just for smaller babies where you're using a linear probe as opposed to a hockey stick, you basically get the entire lung field, anterior, lateral, and posterior. And when you look at the entire lung field, anterior, lateral, and posterior, 
you kind of get the entire upper and lower lung fields just within that single image. So in extremely preterm babies, the, the regions become too small. And rather than dividing them into 12 zones, we actually use just what is a six region method of right anterior, right lateral, right posterior, uh, left anterior, left lateral, left posterior. If you're working out lung ultrasound scores, you will have to divide the anterior region into an upper and lower and then do the lateral as one single region if you're using BRATS methodology. But I would say that what you need to do is you need to first establish amongst your colleagues when you're doing lung ultrasound, what approach you want to take. Uh, very important that when uh, you decide that you take either the six or the 12 region approach, that you stick to what gestations or weights you're going to do it above or below. And that you adopt a, a pragmatic kind of an approach uh, to how you do it. Uh, you know, in extremely preterm babies, the hockey stick has a very small footprint. So you can still see the upper and lower margins, but for anything under 700 grams, I would say you see the whole of the lung fields, even with the hockey stick. Uh, so, you know, uh, just be pragmatic about this. Now, I just want to talk about standardizing terminology and how we will be talking about uh, your peer review. Now, if you're using a 12 region method, as you can see, when I described the initial case, I use standardized terminology to describe my lung areas. And if you look at the lung areas, uh, the right uh, upper anterior is R1, the right lower anterior is R2, the right uh, upper lateral is R3, the right lower lateral is R4. And how do we get these demarcations? So really you're dividing the baby's chest by a parasternal line, which is just half a centimeter adjacent to the sternum. So if, if that's the suprasternal angle of Louis, you draw a straight line. This is just a line that's adjacent to it, but the anterior zone, the, the lateral margin is defined by the anterior axillary line. And uh, the lateral zone is defined as the area between the anterior and the posterior axillary lines then it's a line with the level of the nipples, which basically divides them into upper and lower zones uh, anteriorly. And similarly, if you draw that line you know, at right angles uh, into the lateral zone, you basically divide them into upper and lower zones. Again, posteriorly, really what you want to follow is that line, the internipple line posteriorly. Now, be pragmatic guys. I don't expect you to draw a map on the baby's chest. You know, I, I, we don't, we certainly don't want to have a, a kind of a permanent marker going down the nipple line all the way to kind of make sure that you get, I think what you really need to do is uh, be uh, and judge very well that you're getting a reasonable amount of what I would say is the right upper anterior, right lower anterior. And if you're above the nipple, that should be relatively easy. Below the nipple should be relatively easy. Uh, again, laterally, it shouldn't be difficult for you to get that. What is really good is that when you take the lower regions, anteriorly, laterally, and posteriorly, you start seeing the diaphragm in big babies. So if you see the diaphragm, you know, you can be relatively assured that this is one of the lower regions. But if I see the diaphragm in one of your upper regions uh, in a big baby, I kind of wonder, well, have you really labeled it correctly? In small babies, like I said, if you're using the linear probe, you basically get the whole lung in one region and that can be a challenge. But standardized terminology, and we will be using to start off with a, a slightly different approach while you're learning. But the expectation is once you're up and ready is we use a 12 region method for everything that we describe, uh, which is basically longitudinal scanning of these areas uh, to describe any pathology and uh, that when we report, we report using this terminology. As I mentioned, when you work out lung ultrasound scores, and we'll go through this in great detail, uh, what we would be doing uh, is basically dividing the lung uh, into R1, R2, and the lateral side actually is one whole zone. So basically the R3, R4 becomes one whole zone. And BATS method basically uses a scoring system of zero to three which gives you uh, scores that you can assign for these three zones. So technically three, six, nine, three, six, nine, with a total of 18. And if you look at studies which correlate with uh, say uh, a high sensitivity and a specificity for the diagnosis of respiratory distress syndrome, roughly a score uh, above eight is considered uh, quite, uh, uh, you know, a, a sort of cutoff where the sensitivity uh, and the specificity for diagnosis and excluding respiratory distress syndrome is best. 
uh, we'll talk in more detail about the lung ultrasound scores. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take a little bit of uh, some questions before I go on to the next bit. So any questions so far? Hello, Hello. Can I oh, yeah. sorry, you go first. Um, I just wanted to ask you um, if, uh, so on our lung, I'm uh, sorry, in our ultrasound machine, we've got different protocols like the cranial ultrasound, small parts, abdominal. Is there, there's nothing for lung ultrasound as okay. such. Yeah, so there usually isn't. And what, what I'd say is you will have to create the presets. So I, I have always had to create a preset for lung ultrasound. And a preset kind of means that when you adjust and do your first lung ultrasound, is to get one of the techs in. Now, I would say that a preset for lung ultrasound would be a high frequency above at least eight. Technically, I'd say anywhere between 10 and 14 uh, with the focus at the line of the pleura. The focus can be adjusted later on as well. Now, I'm not gonna go into too much details because there are lots of machines which basically have harmonics. And there is evidence actually that Introducing harmonics can make imaging worse, can improve images in certain situations. So actually, uh, what you've got to do is you've got to get your text in. And what they will do is they will create uh, a preset for lung ultrasound for the preterm baby, which is a higher frequency, maybe 12 to 14, uh, and a lower preset frequency of 8 to 12 for the term babies, uh, saving the, the kind of harmonics in it so that you get optimal images. Even with that, I would say, based on the size of the baby, uh, what you'd have to do is you'd have to adjust and focus might need adjusting to the level of the plura or deeper, depending on where you want to get image quality. But you will have a package. Uh, every hospital has a package for support for their ultrasound machines. I think if you don't, you, you really need uh, kind of, uh, I would say, get in touch with the reps of that company to come and create those presets for you. Thank you. Sorry, there was uh, somebody else. Uh, yeah, yes, uh, just a quick question about the B lines. So yeah. um, I, um, from what I got from you, Dr. Sharma, about the pneumothorax, when there is a pneumothorax, you mentioned that of course there will be absence of sliding at the same time, you said it will be dominant A lines. Um, so, and you said that we will never see B lines in the pneumothorax. Can I know the reason why we can't see B lines in the region? Because technically, for B lines, uh, B lines are created by the presence of interstitial fluid uh, in the interstitial spaces reflecting back ultrasound. I'll be doing this in ultrasound physiology on Sunday. Uh, okay. If you have air in the chest and no fluid, you can't get any B lines because there's no fluid to reflect it back. Okay, great. Uh, my second question is about yeah. the difference between the static and dynamic air bronchograms. So, um, what's the difference, or uh, in terms of the clinical interpretation of that? So, can I? Because we'll cover that in great detail during consolidation and differentiation okay. between atelectasis, there'll, there'll be a whole talk on it. Okay. And it's probably better in that. I think for me, what I was trying to do today was just give you an idea about the concept of pattern recognition and how important that is in lung ultrasound. So, but okay. we will cover that. All right, thank you. A any other questions, guys? Yes, hello, can I ask a question, please? Yeah, Leila, go for it. Okay, so, so parallel, parallel um, um, scanning, uh, I know they taught us initially people were doing scan, but we really don't use it in newborn. newborn. If there's any indication you need to use it. Yeah. So what I'd say is that most importantly, uh, you know, if, if you, you have a high CRP in a baby with significant respiratory distress okay. uh, and you want to look for mnemonic consolidation or consolidation, then in that situation, if the consolidation is located in a particular intercostal space or posteriorly, transfer scanning might not pick it up completely. So I'm just going to give you an example, Leila. I'm just going to go back in this slide presentation, if it'll let me. OK, so this is L2 and L3 in a baby. And I'm just going to play this out for you. 
So what you can see when you see this is very irregular pleura. You can see some A-lines, but a very dominant kind of Coley's B-line profile. But can you see this area over here? Yes. This area basically is, it's a deep consolidation. Now I have picked this up. I am doing a transfer scan, but can you imagine if my transfer scan was in these three intercostal spaces? Yes. I would have probably missed this. Now this will be picked up if you're doing, I would say, uh, scanning in each intercostal space. And you might actually see that it's much larger if you do that, much deeper. So, you know, that, that is one of the indications. I'd also say that for a diagnosis of respiratory distress syndrome, the presence of subpleural consolidation is important, but you get deeper consolidations. And in particular, say if you treat babies or if they have some kind of respiratory distress syndrome, which is mild to moderate or improving, you may not get subtural consolidations, but you still may have deeper consolidations. Uh, again, if there's an infective element to this, we can, we can often have pathology, which includes not just respiratory distress syndrome, but infection, which is causing consolidation, you know, uh, a mnemonic kind of a co-picture. So that is where I would say uh, scanning each intercostal space becomes quite important. Transfer scanning becomes quite important, but I think we have to be very pragmatic. And I would say that History and examination, you know, a 23 weeker scanning every space in the first hour as part of your golden hour kind of sweep, a lot of handling, you lose a lot of insensible kind of uh, water from that baby, you'll be moving that baby quite a bit. And that's where I would say that when we come to kind of scanning protocol, the clinical indication for which you're doing the scan and the information that you hope to gather from it, actually guide what approach I'm going to do in terms of scanning this baby. And it might be that I do not scan each individual intercostal space in that situation. Thank you, thank you. The other thing, um, yeah. um, I look, uh, just for the lady who was asking about the preset. Yeah. When we yeah. did the preset in our machine, we use the small parts. Yep. Yeah. So I think, uh, as I've said, the preset function for lung ultrasound, as Leila said, is usually not there. And you have to get the tech to come in. You can, if you ask your tech over the phone, change your settings to the settings that you need while you're doing a lung ultrasound scan, and you can save those settings if you know how to use your machine yourself. Uh, I've been taught how to do it by uh, my tech, but uh, what is very important is that learning these things really helps because it means that if you want to save a preset for any other kind of a probe, you can, you can actually do it in your machine without getting the text to actually come across. Any other questions? Keep it interactive, guys. We have time. Yeah, yes, I, I would like to, uh, that you repeat how to place the probe in the trans diaphragmatic view and how, uh, how is the shoulder a reference? So I think it'll be easier for me to demonstrate it to you when I, when I show you a video, but it's really how you tilt the probe. So if, can you see me? Can you see me? Can you see my hands? No, we see in presentation only. Okay, so I will make a video of that for you so that you can see exactly how the probe is oriented. It's about tilting the probe so that it, it basically angulates and points towards one of the shoulders. Normally what we, we recommend is that you keep the probe at 90 degrees to the area you're planning to scan. But for the trans diaphragmatic view, if you keep the probe at 90 degrees in the xiphoid process, all you get is the situs view uh, of the heart uh, and the liver. So you basically get the IVC, the aorta, the liver on the right. And really what we want to do is we want to move the probe uh, towards the right and left to look at those subplural kind of regions, subdiaphragmatic regions uh, of the lung. Uh, so they're actually, above the diaphragm, the subdiaphragmatic, because you have the liver below that. And you just have to angulate the probe a little bit. So I will get you a video of how that's done. Any other questions? Yeah, I have uh, a little doubt about yeah. the R1 uh, uh, screen that you showed. So there was a uh, heart shadow that was coming in the R1 area. So I do not expect to see uh, heart in R1. It's not the heart shadow, it's lung pulse. So lung pulse can be transmitted both to the left and the right because of the heart. So you're not getting the shadow of the heart. What you have is lung that's very consolidated. So you're getting an element of lung pulse in the lower lobe. 
Okay, and uh, I have another doubt. So uh, the posterior reason uh, scanning might be uh, technically and practically very challenging. So how do you go about it in every neonate? Do we have to do it or uh, is there any particular indication? So as I said, having a pragmatic approach, if I'm scanning a 23 weeker because I suspect RDS and this baby is on non-invasive respiratory support, uh, really the anterior and lateral regions for a baby who's supine will give me most of the information I need, as would a pneumothorax. You know, so it depends on the indication for which you're scanning. I think what I would say is that mnemonic consolidations can be missed. And I think if the baby is stable enough to be able to do it where you're suspecting mnemonic consolidation, uh, I would recommend that you try to do longitudinal scanning. You can do it very quickly in the anterior lateral regions for a baby that's supine. But the question is how you minimally handle the baby to do the posterior regions very quickly. Uh, gradually, you will develop as you, as, as you become more experienced, your own clinical approach. Just remember that posterior pneumonias uh, can be missed. Uh, if you're not doing the posterior regions, there is emerging evidence from work that's been done by Zamansky and some of the other authors that when, you, when, when a very good example is most of the work that's been done on lung ultrasound scoring has been done for babies in the first 12 to 24 hours of life. These studies have looked at using surfactant to treat these babies and lung ultrasound and lung ultrasound scores. They focus mainly on the anterior and lateral regions. But what we know is that babies can have respiratory distress that is ongoing, evolution of BPD. Uh, they can have infective process pneumonic consolidation if they're on the vent, they can have ventilator required pneumonia. And these changes keep going on. So really the validity of anterior and lateral lung scanning for babies who are much older, say 20 days down the line, uh, is there is potential then to miss things. And I would say that the importance of posterior lung scanning as the baby gets older, becomes very, very important in those situations. Uh, there is, uh, and Almedina will cover bron bronchopulmonary dysplasia and the use of lung ultrasound. And I think she, she will talk and be able to highlight that. All right, thank you. Any other question? Okay, I'm gonna move on. Uh, so we're coming now to kind of, uh, storage reporting and documentation. But what we've done is we've covered a standardized approach to the infant. We've covered the approach to the machine, the transducer we're going to use, what frequencies, where the level of focus should be. We've then spoken about the 12 and the six region method. And if you look at the, the, the kind of terminology we're using, we're standardizing that completely. Uh, so in a way, you now have an idea of how to manage the baby, manage the machine, and what areas to look at. When to use the six region, when to use the 12 region, weight, you know, gestational cutoff, what you agree in your department. But then what you really will be doing is you will be obtaining clips and images which you need to store. And from my perspective, I think what is very important when you use uh, clips and images is that you make sure that you store them in a manner that makes it easy for the next colleague who's coming to review the scan to be able to make sure that if he's doing those regions and you're using the same terminology that you're really covering the same areas. Now, uh, a big mistake that we sometimes make uh, in situations like this is we, we mislabel, but sometimes we don't label at all. And, uh, or sometimes we kind of use different terminologies. So someone says R1, uh, someone says, well, actually, I'm going to use the three region method. So R2 is the lateral, but actually for the 12 region method, R2 is uh, right anterior inferior. And I think this is what we are going to be completely clear about in this course. I'll, I'll take that as we go forwards. Now, all your clips should be stored on your radiology system. So if you're doing lung ultrasound and you don't have a storage system, you do need to have some mechanism of being able to save uh, the actual uh, record of the lung ultrasound. Now that could be printed paper, uh, that could be storage of still images, but the recommendation is that all lung ultrasounds are stored as loops or clips. Uh, now, what, the reason I would emphasize that is if you want to see plural sliding, you want to see dynamic uh, air bronchograms, you want to have a look and try and localize movement of the lung and pleural fluid in your deepest pockets. It's really helpful to be able to see loops. Uh, those clips, again, 
will, from our perspective, consume space. Now, I think what I would say to you is that uh, there is a lot of fixation with space. I think what is more important is that if you've taken that clip and it has an important piece of evidence and you don't save it, then actually what is going to happen is it defeats the purpose of doing the scan in the first place. So for me, adequate storage means you're having and have got all the areas that you wanted to do based on the clinical indication. Uh, most systems which uh, currently operate uh, paperless systems have got uh, mechanisms for these images to be transferred into the electronic patient database. So uh, in Southampton, where I worked, the images used to get transferred, but we'd have to actually open up MedCon to see them. And on packs, we could not store loops. But actually, where I work at the moment, they have a fantastic system where you can see everything. Uh, you can store loops and you can store still images in the same kind of uh, storage system. Most of these storage systems are backed up. So you can imagine the amount of space that's needed to actually create that imaging. And I, I think being sensible, I understand that's just not possible in some settings. But I think what I would say to you is that having no evidence is also not okay. So as far as possible, if you do not have a storage system for loops, try and store your images uh, on printed paper as part of uh, a paper record if that's what you use. So that, say, for example, if you want to refer to them, they can be seen. But more importantly, you know, your colleagues might want to repeat a scan and see progress and see uh, the effect of treatment. And I, I think if they can't see the previous scans, that is not helpful. Uh, in terms of reporting elements, what I would say is that you need to agree as a department exactly what your standard reporting form has. There are lots of reporting forms. And if you go to the section on documentation and reporting, there's a sample kind of... Uh, uh, folder which has about six different kinds of reporting forms and you can choose either. But from my perspective, as I mentioned to you uh, in the first class, uh, we have some homework every four weeks. Now there is homework over here. And what I would like all of us to try and do is try and produce a reporting form by the end of these four weeks. Well, what do you think works for you? Why? And we'll have a session on kind of discussing the reporting form. And, uh, you know, for the reporting form that we think uh, is the best, maybe there's a very expensive bottle of champagne down the line. So let's, that's the homework and I'll email you about that. But I think as a bare minimum, there are three elements of any reporting form. So it's reporting of all the findings that you see in the regions as described. Interpretation of those findings. Well, what is your clinical interpretation? a conclusion, and then a recommendation of any if there's treatment or a follow-up scan. I also, as a, a matter of a kind of, a, I would say, reporting, would emphasize, and I don't do that myself, is you should write about the probe used and the frequency and any scan limitations. Now, that is important, because if your colleague wants to do a lung ultrasound, he probably might want to use the same probe now, you might be using a lower frequency or a higher frequency, and his use of frequency might then interpret. You can have different lung findings based on different probes, as I've described to you, as well as different frequencies. So you should include that as part of the report. The scan length, which is part of our system at the Corniche, any sedation used, but any complication the baby has. What, what things might you document? And please don't worry about this. We'll, we'll be talking about this in great detail when we, we look at the difference between the normal and the abnormal lung. Uh, as a bare minimum, for each area that you look at, lung sliding, the pleura, lung profiles. Now, this is something that has not been described in the literature, but this is something that we are going to learn. It's something that I have kind of developed in my clinical practice, but it's really helpful because if you're using the concept of lung profiles, you're really talking about the same standard terminology of the appearance of the lung. M mode appearances, the presence or absence of B lines, their quantity, uh, then the presence of consolidation. And again, if you're doing each intercostal space, that might be highly relevant. Uh, presence of effusion, and then any other findings, like if you're doing a diagnostic paracentesis and you feel that actually instead of the fifth, it's actually the sixth space that is got the maximum amount of fluid. We always worry about going below that, but actually a lot of people like to go in the triangle of safety, but actually 
the reason for that is you want to avoid puncturing the liver. But if you've got an ultrasound that clearly shows where the liver is, and the six space has got the largest amount of fluid collection uh, posteriorly for a baby who's in supine position, then actually it might be beneficial to go in that space. So these are the things. In terms of nomenclature for reporting, this is the standard that we'll be using in our course. So the blue diagram that you can see on the right-hand side basically means that I would say that you're anonymizing everything, but when you peer review and share your images, and look, I don't expect us to see 12 images uh, and every intercostal space. I think that's crazy. We'll pro probably be there all day. But what I would say is my expectation is that once you're completely familiar and up to speed with performing lung ultrasound, that your standard should be doing the anterior, lateral, posterior regions, uh, longitudinal scanning, uh, and doing the six region approach uh, on either side and describing these things as a bare minimum. But then when you come to reporting, it's the interpretation of these things that you report. Uh, you report for each region and I'll share a sample report with you. But the conclusion then is, well, what is, what is, what is your clinical diagnosis? What do you think is going on with the lung? And then what do you recommend in terms of treatment, if any? Uh, I think having this kind of format is really helpful. And then you've got lots of really nice lung ultrasound reporting forms that are part of your training, which can be downloaded from the actual portal. What we're trying to do by actually creating a nomenclature for reporting is basically ensure that you scan all the lung regions and you can see all the relevant areas based on the clinical indication for which you're doing the scan. So a good example is if I'm doing a scanning for lung ultrasound score and I'm using BRATS method, actually I am gonna do R1, R2, but for R3, R4, I'm only scanning the lateral region once. Now, if I'm using a lineal probe in a very small baby, that'll cover the whole of the lung field. So again, the indication for which I'm doing the scan is very different to performing a full lung ultrasound scan, minimizes handling, and it's giving me the information I need as opposed to using the 12 region approach, which would be a lot of handling, a lot of time in a baby who's extremely preterm and 23 weeks of gestation. So think about the indication for reporting, but be aware that if you're doing lung ultrasound scores, the nomenclature can change a little bit. Again, uh, just to give you a little bit of an, a kind of an emphasis, uh, I, I expect those of you who are learning lung ultrasound in the peer review phase, to, if the baby's supine, I don't want you to handle babies unnecessarily to kind of fulfill your training needs. So I'm really happy in the peer review to have a look at uh, the right anterior, the right lateral regions, the left anterior and the left lateral regions. So if you kind of have four images of the six region method, I'm very happy with that. Uh, I think what I would say is that if you come with just one lung image later on, uh, it kind of defeats the purpose of trying to make some kind of a diagnosis of what we think is wrong with the lung. As a first, what I would say is for the next three weeks, all I want you to do is put a probe on the chest and recognize plural sliding, the plural line, what A lines look like, what B lines look like, what the morphology is of different kinds of B lines and what the profiles are. And I'm hoping that by the first week of next month, we'll be in a situation where we can then move forwards with further scanning. So this is where we are at the moment. We're, we're kind of in the peer reviews phase. I'm gonna assume that all of you are kind of joining us as level one practitioners. If you want, and you want to share peer review, as I have said to you, there will be some sessions which are dedicated specifically for peer review with very short theoretical sessions. The first such session is on the 26th. For those of you who would like to share a peer review, I just want one image of the anterior and lateral lung fields. Uh, that could be the right or left lung. I do not need you to take four images. What we're focusing on is just recognition of the plura, your description of it, recognition of sliding, how you think sliding is. Do you think it's good sliding? Do you think the sliding is poor? Uh, making sure that you identify, and I'm not too worried about A and B lines at this point because we'll do that lecture on Sunday. But I think what is very, very crucial is that you are using the standard protocol that we've espoused today. So you switch your machine on, you select a preset lung ultrasound setting if it's there, but if not, you're gonna have to select your transducer now, in your transducer, what I would say to you 
is that a lot of preset settings include lung ultrasound, MSK superficial or vascular superficial. You can use those preset settings as well. Uh, the most important thing is you will need to increase your depth if it's vascular and MSK. MSK usually presets to a depth of about two centimeters. You really need to go up to four centimeters. Uh, importantly, uh, again, very small babies will need a higher frequency. Now, just showing you uh, a probe frequency, if I can show that to you. I don't have that in this particular presentation, but really your probes, uh, the convex probes kind of five to eight, but then you have uh, L6 to 15, which is the linear hockistic probe. Now that defaults to a frequency based on where your machine defaults it to. So you might start at eight, but an extremely small baby, you might want to increase that frequency, go up to 10, 12. Look at your image, see what the image quality is like. And really what you need to do then is, is basically optimize your focus. If you're looking at the superficial areas to the line of the pleura. So focus usually comes on the left side. Can you see these arrows over here? These are the focus arrows. And really what you want to do is take this focus up to the level of the pleura. Uh, there are machines which have auto gain settings. Now, auto gain basically means that what it does is it basically adjusts uh, the background gain. Now, there is spatial gain and there is gain that is transverse gain. Each machine is different. In our, in our machine on the GE, we use transverse gain. And I would say to you that you can use auto gain functions, but sometimes the auto gain function, if your probe is not in good contact, kind of defaults to settings which, which might not be optimum. So don't hesitate then to play with the gain. But more importantly, if you're using horizontal gain, your gain might be different in different segments. And to optimize the deeper structures, you might have to play with the gain settings on your machine. Again, I would say that if you have a particular machine and you're struggling with it, I'm very happy for you to write to me and say, look, I'm struggling with my machine. And what we might be able to do is arrange a bottom call for us to have a look at your machine and see how we optimize your settings. Okay, so we've talked about the kind of progress. So, you know, I would say that really what we want to focus once you're more established with your lung ultrasound approach, especially if you're thinking about making diagnosis is using the 12 region method, standardized terminology, which then focuses on reporting that in a standardized way with a focus on these particular aspects as a bare minimum. So that brings us near to the end of the talk. In summary, what we've discussed is a standardized approach to how we optimize imaging, looking at the infant, making sure that we use our machine and its settings to a standard that is clearly documented in two articles by Jing Liu and Dr. Kripa. I would strongly recommend you use them. And there is a video in the chapter on machine settings by Jing Liu, which also takes you through harmonics and spectral gain. And I'm going to be really honest with you. Don't worry about them. Just start scanning. Uh, I think what is important from your perspective is that if, if possible, you get somebody from the tech team to come in and try and set your lung ultrasound machine to a preset standard. And really that should be done whilst you're actually examining and doing a patient. And the best way is if you can do a preterm and a term baby to try and optimize those settings. We've spoken about partition. Two standard methodologies that we will be using are the six region and the 12 region method. Six region method in smaller babies, 12 region method pretty much in big babies. Uh, Bratz method will use the anterior and natural method. We've talked about reporting, reporting forms. Just remember when you're reporting and you report contemporaneously, it's really important that you are thinking about your conclusion and recommendations. So if you're scanning a baby and doing lung ultrasound scores with a view to giving surfactant, uh, you can do a post scan, but a post scan done after 30 minutes will show no difference because surfactant is fluid and it fills the lungs up. So if you do a scan and recommend that you do a scan post surfactant in 30 minutes, you really just see B profiles throughout the lung field and you'll think, oh, the RDS hasn't improved. Actually, what you need to do is clinically correlate. And there's a very nice article, which is part of the lung ultrasound score chapter, which basically shows that if you scan, this is by Turkish authors, at two, four, six hours, you can actually see improvement in babies, uh, extremely preterm babies as well with surfactant. So again, you know, it's really important that you report, you make recommendations for scan as appropriate, 
and that you don't scan unnecessarily. You know, I, I think I can't emphasize that enough. In extremely preterm babies, just do not touch them. Keep those incubator doors closed. Try to minimize insensible losses. You know, really what, what you're trying to do is handle them as minimally as possible. And documentation. So a standardized quality improvement methodology is you document in a standard area. Now, if in your kind of institute, you have notes and you're documenting lung ultrasound kind of diagnosis in a particular area, a good quality improvement project is actually having a form which has a certain color. So lung ultrasound is actually yellow or green. So if they're kept in the notes, somebody can actually go back to the last lung ultrasound and see when it was done and what the report was like. For online paperless systems, that's quite difficult. And actually having uh, maybe uh, a preset kind of a form on that, which I can share with you, the one that we created for Southampton, uh, which basically shows you how you might want to report, but that is kept in a preset place, which means you can see all the lung ultrasounds in a preset place. You can see all the cranial ultrasounds and you can follow them up. And that might mean that you have to work with your IT team to create something like that. I'm gonna stop there because it's exactly 8.30 for me. Any questions before we, we, we stop, please? Would we be, be able now to see the content on the portal? Yes. So you should be able to see I, the content. I can't see it. Okay. You should be able to. Everybody, I have I have added the lung ultrasound portal to everybody's individual account. If you can't see it, just email me. Okay. Any other questions? Guys, I love questions. Okay, I am grateful for your stamina today. Uh, I am extremely grateful for the last two days for you giving up your time. But most importantly, I think what I would like to emphasize is it's time to pick up a probe. Uh, I think what is very important from our perspective is that for those of you who want mentoring in particular, that you're able to share those images in an anonymized way, and the first session for that will be the 26th. I'll be sending out a link for it. It's, you don't need to attend all sessions. You won't be able to attend all sessions, but all the sessions are live recorded and will be sent to you and will be part of the portal within 24 to 48 hours. So clearly if you've missed any session, please do not worry. Also, my humble request is, look guys, try to block this time period out. You know, really the best way to learn when you're kind of having interactive discussions is trying to stay here. Ongoing sessions will be 90 minutes where we'll have 45 minutes of peer review and 45 minutes of kind of, I would say, interactive discussion uh, after the next talk on Sunday. So these three talks are very theoretical, but with the peer review, there'll be a lot of questions and answers. And I would humbly request that you arrive on time uh, I've already emphasized after 7.15, it becomes very difficult for me to kind of admit you and it just interrupts the flow for other participants. So please try and block out this time. Try not to have anything else that makes you busy. God bless you. Thank you very much. Stay safe. Thank you.